Pediatric Cardiology Today. My name is Dr. Robert Pass, and I'm the host of this podcast. I am professor of pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai here in New York City, where I'm also the chief of pediatric cardiology. Thank you very much for joining me for this 296th episode of the podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed last week's episode on the topic of right atrial thrombus following closure of ASDs with the Gore Cardioform device. We spoke with Dr. Barry Love of my own institution, Mount Sinai. And for those of you interested in interventional cardiology and ASD closure, I'd certainly recommend you take a listen to last week's episode, 295. As I say most weeks, if you'd like to get in touch with me, my email is easy to remember. It's pdheart at gmail.com. This week, we move into the world of interventional cardiology, but also cardiovascular surgery. The title of the work we'll be reviewing is Cardiac Catheterization Interventions in the Right Ventricular Outflow Tract and Branch Pulmonary Arteries Following the Arterial Switch Operation. The first author of this work is Michael Gritty and the senior author, Audrey Marshall. And this work comes to us from the Division of Pediatric Cardiology at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. When we're done reviewing this paper, the first author of this work, who's a pediatric cardiology fellow at Toronto Sick Kids Hospital, Michael Gritty, has graciously agreed to join us. Therefore, let's move straight on to this article and then a conversation with its first author. This week's work starts with a few general comments about detransposition, reminding that it accounts for 5 to 7% of cyanotic and general heart disease, and how the treatment of choice in this era is the arterial switch operation, in addition to VSD closure when needed. The quoted survival rates are greater than 98% acutely and more than 96% at one year following this surgery. And the authors state that those survival rates are superb for this operation. Many have mild or more hemodynamic burdens, with the majority being related to the RV and RV hypertension. The reason for this is the need for translocation of the PA in the so-called Lecompte maneuver. And we're all aware that this part of the arterial switch operation can result in branch pulmonary artery stenosis which is due either to native PA hypoplasia or the geometry of the pulmonary arteries relative to the aorta, whereby they are, to use the author's term, sitting astride the ascending aorta, or possibly may be due to progressive dilation of the native ascending aorta. They quote prior literature that suggests that the incidence of RV outflow tract obstruction is somewhere in the range between 5 and 28% at long-term follow-up, And when a significant degree of obstruction is seen on non-invasive monitoring such as echo, these patients often come to catheterization to directly measure the degree of obstruction and potentially intervene. Few studies have assessed the impact of intervention in the pulmonary arteries or RV outflow tract after the arterial switch, and so the authors state that the purpose of this study is to quote them, quote, to characterize a subset of patients with a right heart cath after an arterial switch operation by describing the degree and nature of RV outflow obstruction and findings associated with intervention. We also assess the hemodynamic importance of transcatheter RV outflow tract interventions and observe their safety. The authors performed a review of the database of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario, Canada from January 2004 to December 2020, and they tried to remove from the list patients who had caths only for septostomy prior to surgery and they review how they found the cases that they did. As the goal was to look only at patients who had RV or pulmonary artery issues following a switch, they did not include caths performed exclusively for left heart issues, such as coronary imaging or other forms of left-sided intervention or problems. They state that looking back at the old records, they surmised that the most important reason for the caths was RV hypertension with an RV to aortic ratio of greater than two-thirds. Other indications were a gradient in the branch pulmonary arteries over 20, or a more than 25% size discrepancy between the right and left branch pulmonary arteries. Again, this study really was looking mostly at those who had a right heart cath, by which they mean only diagnostic, and those who had a right heart intervention, or what the authors call an interventional right heart cath. All sorts of data was recorded for these procedures, but importantly, not very much after. And on to the results. There were 544 unique patients who had an arterial switch in the 17-year period of this study at the Hospital for Sick Children, and ultimately 150 patients were identified who had a postoperative cath. However, strangely, the authors state that there were insufficient record of catheterization for fully 40 of the 150 patients who underwent a cath, and so this left only 110 patients total to review. Overall, of these 110 patients, 
58 had either a diagnostic right heart cath, of which there were nine total, or an interventional cath, of which there were 49, with the rest having a left-sided assessment or intervention. And so this work is really looking at the 58 patients who had a right heart cath that was either diagnostic or interventional in nature. So again, only nine of the 58 patients had a diagnostic cath, with the remaining 49 actually undergoing 76 right-sided interventional caths. The median age at cath was 0.9 years, and the average was three years. The patient anatomy was broadly classified into 43% who had DTGA with a VSD, DTGA with an intact septum, and 19% with double outlet right ventricle and malposed great vessels. So what were the most common indication for the 86 total caths in these 58 patients? Well, it seemed that the most common indication was RV hypertension, which was confirmed in 36 cases, or 42% on cath. 25 cases, or 29%, had significant branch PA gradients, with 25 cases to the right and 25 to the left. In 19%, or 13 cases, there was a significant discrepancy between the right and left-sided pulmonary arteries by size. 25 cases in the series, the authors could not assess the rationale for the cath based on the data that they had. Thus, let's summarize the 110, or 20%, who had a cath after surgery, with 90% of the right heart catheterizations getting an intervention, which was either a balloon or stent. When comparing the right heart diagnostic and interventional cases to one another, perhaps not surprisingly, RV hypertension was seen in 46% of the intervened upon patients versus 10% of the diagnostic right heart cath patients, which was statistically different, with RV to LV pressure ratios of about 70% in the patients who underwent an intervention and 52% in the non-intervention cases. Amongst the interventions, the numbers of RPA and LPA stenoses were even at 33% or 25 patients each. In the 79 interventional cases performed in 49 patients, there were 27 RPA balloon dilations, 42 LPA balloon dilations, and 10 MPA dilations. In 15 cases, a stent was placed in the RPA, 16 in the LPA, and 4 in the MPA. On the whole, the mean RV to systemic pressure ratio fell modestly but significantly from about 70% to 56% in those who had an intervention. The authors explained that the mean balloon diameter was about 9 to 9.7 millimeters in the RPA and LPA, and we already reviewed how the RV pressure fell on average about 10 to 15%, with both RPA and LPA gradients falling about 11 millimeters of mercury on the RPA after balloon dilation and 10 on the LPA with similar increases in PA size of about half to two millimeters in diameter. The authors review that stents were placed only if a balloon dilation was done first and was unsuccessful. Of the stents placed, in five, bilateral stents were required at the time of intervention, and the RV to aortic ratio was higher in these cases, at nearly systemic or 80%. And what about complications? Well, surprisingly and reassuringly, these were rare. There was a small LPA dissection and RPA aneurysm with neither requiring intervention. One patient had an RPA stent placed that compressed an SVC stent that had to be redilated in situ. There was also a case of a wire tip that became entrapped in a distal LPA branch. There were a few EP complications, including transient heart block that resolved and one episode of non-sustained VT. There were a few minor complications. Importantly, there were no examples of AP window creation in the lab or ascending aortic distortion. In their discussion, the authors state that, quote, of the 58 patients with available records of right heart catheterization intervention at the time of catheterization, intervention was common but not universal. In 10 cases, or 12%, findings at cath did not result in intervention. In this study, intervention was associated with decreases in RV pressure and increases in PA dimension. Our data shows that a significant decrease in RV to systemic pressure ratio could be achieved using a sequential approach of balloon dilation, often followed by stent placement in patients after arterial switch operation. The sidedness of branch PA stenosis was predominantly left, but both sides could effectively be improved through catheter intervention with minimal risk to the patient. The authors state that overall, the 11% rate of patients after a switch needing a right heart cath was similar to prior works on this topic. They explain how the majority of the patients having a right heart cath had a problem, which I suppose would hopefully be expected, as we would not typically send cases to the lab if we didn't feel there was a strong rationale based on non-invasive assessment. They speak about how branch PA stenosis was the most common encountered lesion. 
They offer some theories on why these patients have pulmonary artery stenosis, such as surgical factors, neoaortic dilation, or smaller pre-op branch PAs, and how all of these likely contributed. They review the point that balloon dilation alone was able to decrease RV pressure from roughly two-thirds to 50% in most, and how dilation seemed to work similarly well on both sides. They mention again how there were 42 balloon dilations in the LPA versus the RPA where there were 27, and offer some theories on why LPAs seem to need more interventions. The authors explain that their preference for balloon dilation before consideration of stenting was was shown in this work to be a good approach as it was effective in most and allowed for some testing of the geometric alterations that might occur as well as any possible aortic impingement were a stent to be placed. In regards to complications, they mention how prior works have shown there to be a small but reproducible rate of complications in the pulmonary artery in this setting, but how they did not see almost any of these. They point to the limitation of this work, including its retrospective nature, the inconsistent data on why patients were referred, including limited data on clinical signs or symptoms, as well as a pretty much complete lack of post-cath data, so we can't learn much about the durability of the effect or even late complication rate. And so they conclude, 20% of children after arterial switch operation were referred for cardiac catheterization, and 11% had an assessment for RV hypertension or RV outflow tract obstruction. At the time of right heart calf, 90% had intervention with either balloon, stent, or both. As would be expected, higher degrees of RV hypertension were associated with a greater likelihood of an intervention being performed. Also, all interventions, balloon and or stent, at either location, RPA or LPA, decreased RV pressure and the severity of gradients into the affected PA. Severe complications associated with these interventions were not observed in our population. Well, this is an interesting work in that it suggests two things that to me seem somewhat unusual. First, the paper suggests that simple balloon dilation may be adequate in this situation in a fairly large percentage of patients. That has not really been my experience, and I do wonder what the echocardiograms look like the next day after fairly modest improvements in the RV to AO ratios that are reported here. I've seen these sorts of changes in the lab, only to have my non-invasive colleagues tell me the next day that the echo looked basically the same as pre-op. This intervention of not having much impact from a balloon dilation has always made sense to me, as it's strange to me that PA narrowings would respond to balloon dilation, given that oftentimes the reason that these patients will have narrowed pulmonary arteries is inadequacy of the Lecompte, with draping and stretching of the pulmonary arteries that causes the gradients, rather than a true discrete stenosis where a balloon dilation would typically be more likely to be effective. The fact that a large number of repeat caths were done might offer a clue to the possibility that the achieved results may not have been as good as suggested. Also, not having post-cath echoes and serial follow-up is a serious limitation. I'm also surprised by the absence of any AP window formation in this group, as this has been reported previously. On the one hand, it's nice to see that simple balloon dilation was so effective. On the other, The absence of follow-up echo in clinical data does make me wonder regarding the durability of these somewhat small gains. I'm also honestly a little bit shocked that Lee Benson's old lab could not find the cath information on 40 patients in only the past 16 years. All who know Dr. Benson know that he is a very careful and kind of strict guy, and so the notion that 40 patients' data is not available in his center, where so many long-term cath studies have been performed, It's kind of shocking. It does make me wonder about how these results would look if fully 26% of all the caths done in this patient group had actually been included for review in this study. In the interest of time, I think we should move forward and talk with the work's first author, Dr. Gritty. Joining the podcast now to discuss this week's work is its first author, Dr. Michael Gritty. Dr. Gritty is a graduate of McGill University for college. He went on to medical school at the University of Toronto and then performed his residency in pediatrics at Toronto Sick Kids Hospital, where he is presently a categorical fellow in pediatric cardiology. Dr. Gritty states that he is a proud Canadian who's Toronto born and raised, and he is looking forward to pursuing a career in interventional cardiology. It is a delight to have such a young up and coming superstar on the podcast. Welcome Dr. Gritty to the podcast. I'm here now with Dr. Michael Gritty of Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. Michael, thank you very much for joining us this week on the podcast. Good afternoon, Dr. Pass. I've been a listener to the podcast for years, so it's an absolute privilege to have the opportunity to discuss our work on your platform. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you, and thank you for listening. Congratulations to you and your co-investigators. 
You know, Michael, one of the things I thought was noteworthy was that you had so few actual pulmonary artery complications, despite the fact that the literature suggests that things like AP window creation is not uncommon in this particular uh, disease. Sometimes this can't actually be told easily in the cath lab, meaning you can get an AP window, but you might not actually know it from an, a PA uh, injection. Do you have any insights into why balloon dilation and stenting in your experience in Toronto didn't seem to result uh, in some of the more worrisome findings like AP window creation? Was it related, do you think, to a difference in angioplasty technique or balloon sizing? That's a great question and really underscores one of the key findings of our work. So the complication of AP window creation post Leconte, like you said, has been well documented with a notable case report uh, that I saw by Shaq Qureshi over 10 years ago. Uh, and more recently by Dr. Jesse Lee's group at Ratty Children's Hospital, which you featured in a previous episode of your podcast. Our study, though, which is just a single center, had a larger sample size. And importantly, like you said, we observed no acute AP window uh, creations. Our hypothesis regarding the absence of AP window formation is likely multifactorial. Firstly, heightened awareness of this complication, as evidenced by prior studies, likely influenced our operators to adopt a more conservative approach to, to PA stenosis post post-switch patients. Unlike other substrates like tetralogy of Fallot, where a more aggressive treatment may be pursued, our approach really prioritized caution, possibly mitigating the risk of AP window formation. Notably, a recent study by Joshua Kurtz's group in Kentucky also reported no AP windows post branch PA reinterventions, which is consistent with our finding. And although I cannot specifically comment on angioplasty technique, I can speak, Dr. Pass, on our institutional practice. Mm -hmm. And that's it, kids. Our approach, um, really with post-switch patients in branched PA stenosis, involves a stepwise strategy beginning with balloon angioplasty and assessing the response before considering stenting. This conservative approach may contribute to our lower complication rates. And we have to keep in mind that this approach is not always the one that was advocated for at all institutions. One of the earliest studies in this patient substrate came from the group in Rome in 2000, where they actually compared balloon angioplasty versus stenting in post-switch patients. In that paper, they advocated for primary stenting in this patient subset. Mm. It's possible that this more aggressive approach may have led to more complications. And if you look at Dr. Lee's paper from San Diego, although they comment on a conservative approach, the actual data shows they used more stents than balloons, which is different than our paper. I see. Yeah, very interesting. And thank you for that historical reference. That's great. Uh, Michael, when you dilated in your group separate PA stenosis, I thought it was of a note that you almost always saw a modest reduction in the RV pressure or the RV to aortic pressure ratio with the average falling from about two-thirds systemic to one-half systemic. I'm wondering if you have any idea of the if the modest gains that you saw with the balloon dilation in the cath lab were durable. A lot of patients in your group did seem to require re-intervention, and in my experience, it's not uncommon that um, I get that type of result and my echo folks the next day tell me it looks exactly the same. Um, I'm wondering uh, if this reflects, if you know, whether the f findings you described were transient or were largely uh, durable results. Great question. And then this really raises an important consideration regarding the durability of the gains from balloon dilation in patients with PA stenosis post-switch. And while we lack definitive data on the long-term durability of balloon dilation as compared to stents, our analysis of the balloon dilation cohort reveals some interesting trends. When I look back at the data, 80% of the patients that underwent a balloon dilation in our study did not actually require further intervention, suggesting that the mod modest gains may have in fact been durable while well, at least durable enough not to prompt the referring cardiologist to refer them back to us. However, the fact that a notable proportion of patients did require re-intervention does raise questions about the sustainability of these improvements. And I think this, you can have multiple interpretations to this data. So on one hand, you could argue that due to the fact that some patients require, required catheter intervention, these patients could have benefited from stenting during that index procedure, Dr. Pass, suggesting that a more aggressive approach could have been beneficial. However, previous studies highlighting complications associated with stenting may have led us to use caution in adopting this approach. But another interpretation could be that our stepwise strategy of balloon dilation followed by stenting may have led to a selection bias where we inadvertently subselected patients for balloons that may have had a more mild phenotype, slightly with better initial hemodynamics. And this could also explain why we had such few patients requiring reintervention.
However, when talking about the modest gains in durability, I think we should address one of the elephants in the room, which adds complexity to this discussion. And that is the uncertainty surrounding the benefits of aggressively lowering RV pressure in a post arterial switch patient. Most of our knowledge in this area really stems from different congenital subtypes like Tetralogy of Fallot. And it's possible that operators may have been inclined to accept relatively incremental reductions in RV pressure in this specific cohort. Really that perfection is the enemy of good uh, that you said on your last podcast and something that I agree with. So in summary, while our study does suggest that balloon dilation as a primary procedure followed by stenting if necessary, may be advisable to direct stenting, the durability of these gains really remains an area for further investigation. So Michael, what you're saying is that the team in Toronto has a theory that maybe it's not necessary to get the RV to a perfect level, that half systemic is plenty fine. Is, is that what you're suggesting possibly is true? That's what our data does show. Okay, okay, great. You know, one of the things I was interested about in this work is it sort of upended a thought I had about this. In your in your uh, preamble in the paper in the introduction, you talk about the most common reasons that patients have obstruction, which is uh, after a switch, which is the uh, inadequacy of the Lecompte where the PAs are sitting astride the aorta, often causing bilateral stretching and uh, effectively stenosis. And I wondered when you saw one-sided obstruction, whether it was RPA or LPA, as was seen in a number of your patients, what's the theory you guys have on, on what the cause is for sort of unilateral pulmonary artery stenosis in this patient group. And I'm wondering why you felt that balloon dilation was effective for this type of stenosis. And finally, um, why do you think the LPA seemed to be more affected than on average than the RPA? Like you said, so when we see bilateral branched PA stenosis, the likely culprit is the Lecomte maneuver, which of course, like you said, results from the pulmonary artery sitting astride the ascending aorta. And we have some really nice figures in the paper that show this. Yes. This is the type of obstruction that we'd be expected to respond poorly to simple branched PA balloon dilation due to the anatomical stretching of those PAs. In contrast, the mechanism of unilateral branched PA stenosis has multiple proposed mechanisms. One that made sense to our group, Dr. Pass, was that it was really from a sick kid study by Dr. Lars Gross Warman and Dr. Colin Morgan, where they noted through MRI studies that the greater rightward position of the neopulmonary root significantly pulled on the LPA more than the RPA post-switch. Mm. This would be potentially one of the explanations why in our specific study, we have significantly more LPA interventions than RPA ones. In regards to why unilateral obstruction may respond to balloons, I cannot specifically say from this study, but I can say that they did respond in some cases. However, we do know lesions such as discrete LPA stenosis or an LPA co-arc would be expected to respond a bit better to balloon dilation, and we do see some of these type of lesions. Yeah, yeah, that seemed clear from your report. Uh, And I was wondering also, what was the most common reason that when patients did need a re-intervention that they did? Simple answer, is RV hypertension greater than two-thirds systemic? Mm -hmm. However, the more nuanced answer here, Dr. Pass, highlights why we even did this project to begin with. And that answer really started with another question. What does requiring re-intervention truly mean in a post-op switch? We as a field don't actually have consensus on who requires re-intervention and who doesn't. From this study, all we can say is that these patients were re-referred to the cath lab and that the interventionalist chose to perform an intervention. Our study design was such that we retrospectively tried to infer the indication for cath and separated the patients into three main categories. The first being RV hypertension as defined as an RV to systemic pressure ratio of greater than two thirds systemic. The second being branch PA stenosis where you had a gradient that was greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. And lastly, was a size discrepancy on angiography of greater than 25% between the left and the right pulmonary arteries, which is what we used as a surrogate for differential blood flow as we did not have consistent lung perfusion studies at the time of referral. And with that, when I went back to the data, like I had said, the main indication for re-intervention was an RV to systemic pressure ratio that remained greater than two-thirds systemic. Yeah, yeah. Would have been great if you had those clinical data to see what was in the minds of the cardiologists when they referred them. But I, I know this was largely a cath 
database uh, based study so uh, I guess but it was interesting that you were able to ferret out those rationales there well for those in the audience it is uh, the middle of the workday in Toronto and New York City so I'm gonna stop imposing on Dr. Gritty uh, by just asking one final question which was uh, Michael do you have any idea if uh, any of the patients who underwent calf um, ultimately needed patch plasty of their pulmonary arteries or do you have any any information on any patients that had patch plasty and in past literature i know that has generally not been associated with great outcomes but i'm wondering if you have any information about that at all in this group although it's not reported in this manuscript two patients did require surgical plasty of the pas after an attempted cath intervention these are patients with the most severe phenotype of rv hypertension that was around systemic I think understanding our sick kids approach to PA um, stenosis post switch would actually be helpful for others here, especially to the referring cardiologist, which is the intended audience of this paper, even more so than the interventionalist. At sick kids, Dr. Bass, all reinterventions on branched PAs, first off, are made at a multidisciplinary conference. And on average, echo data showing RV pressures greater than 70% systemic or branched PA peak gradients on echo of order over 40 millimeters of mercury are considered reasonable patients to intervene on. Generally at sick kids, we try a cath intervention first with the balloon dilation being the first line therapy. And then we try our best as possible to avoid the use of stents in the substrate. And I think this is why our complication rate is so low. Then when it comes to surgical reoperation, we indicated in three specific scenarios. One, which you highlight in this question, is when the PA stenosis is refractory to cath intervention. Two, is if the branched PA, specifically the LPA, is too close to the coronary arteries, risking coronary compression. And lastly, if there's a complex multi-level obstruction in the RVOT. If you'd like to see this approach laid out, our senior surgeon at SickKids, Dr. Osami Hanjo, published a really nice paper in 2022 in JTCVS about pre-op risk factors that led to reintervention in branch PAs after the arterial switch. And in that paper, the team explicitly lays out our sick kids approach. And with that, I hope you can get a sense of why our institutional approach may have led to less AP window creations, less coronary compressions, and possibly why we still have some catheter reinterventions and some rare patients that you describe in this question that require surgical reoperations. Well, uh, that's a wonderful description, uh, and I, I'm sure those listening to this this week are going to find that very, very uh, important as a uh, little bit of an algorithm to th- how to think about these patients and who should be referred. And as I'm often apt to say, uh, you clearly are taking a conservative approach where the enemy of good is better, and uh, it seems like you got very good results, and uh, maybe that's maybe we should be happy with those. <laughs> so. Uh, With that, I think we'll end today. Michael, congratulations to you, all of your co-investigators, especially my friend, Dr. Audrey Marshall, who was a co-fellow with mine and who I think of greatly. Uh, Congratulations to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us this week on the podcast. An absolute pleasure talking to you, Dr. Pass, and I look forward to hopefully meeting you in the future. With that, though, I'd be dismissed if I didn't specifically thank the people that made this work possible, specifically Dr. Audrey Marshall, the supervisor of this project, and my mentors, Dr. Brian McCrindle and Dr. Lee Benson, as well as my co-authors, Pedro Farid, who's a great medical student in London, Ontario, and my uh, colleague and peer, Dr. Ahmed Hassan, who's another cardiology fellow at the Hospital for Sick Children. Their efforts really have made this project a success, and I want to thank them for that. Well, thank you for highlighting all of those co-investigators, and again, thank you very much, Michael. Have a wonderful day. You too. Well, once again, I'm reminded after this interview of the great future that our field has with such an outstanding up-and-coming superstar like Dr. Gritty. I'm sure that you, like me, were impressed by the very thoughtful answers that he provided for us. Off-air, he explained to me that though there is a suggestion in this work that there are 40 patients in whom the cath data was not available, there were a number of changes in the electronic medical record during the study period and the actual number of unincluded studies may be far less than this number 40, but he acknowledged that this was a potential source of bias for the work. It seems clear that the message here is perhaps twofold. First, there's a belief that adopting a conservative, stepwise approach to this intervention was clearly associated with both an efficacious outcome as well as a low complication rate. Second, I think it's clear from this conversation that to a very substantial degree, the doctors in Toronto wonder if we might be trying to be perhaps a bit too perfect 
Half-systemic RV pressure generally has been associated with favorable outcomes in most disorders of the right ventricle and pulmonary arteries, such as tetralogy. And I think Michael's argument that perhaps accepting a half-systemic RV in this particular disease of transposition might be preferable to the possible negative outcomes associated with a more aggressive dilation strategy. Of course, we just don't know, but with the explosive growth of our ACHD population, the answer to that question and many others will likely become quite obvious over the next one to two decades. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Gritty for taking time out of his very busy schedule as a cardiology fellow to speak with us this week on the podcast. To conclude this 296th episode of PD Heart Pediatric Cardiology today, we hear the lovely Italian art song, Caro Mio Ben, which was written by Giuseppe Giordani. In this lovely song, the singer declares, Dearest, my beloved, believe me at least this much, without you my heart languishes. Today we hear one of the greatest singers of the 20th century, Luciano Pavarotti, in this live performance from over 40 years ago. I've chosen to play this lovely song because I hear on good authority that Pavarotti is one of the favorite singers of Dr. Gritti's family. Thank you for joining me for this 296th episode, and thanks once again to Dr. Greedy. I hope all have a good week ahead. Yeah. Uh-huh.